Uh, Dave praying reminds me of an incident um, soon after I got baptized in the Holy Spirit. I was living in this uh, tiny, tiny house um, with other people, obviously, four-roomed house. And uh, how many of you know that when you get baptized in the Holy Spirit, you are very noisy, or at least I was? And so praying in the morning was a bit of a problem because, you know, I'd, I'd wake up around five and uh, I'd disturb the household. So down the road, about a mile down the road, there was a church, and uh, we used to go to that church, and the church was a dead church. Uh, it, it was sort of, you know, a huge room with two rooms at the back. And I took over one of the rooms at the back as my prayer room. This particular morning, I get there, and I go into my prayer room as usual, and I had a ball of a time with the Lord. It was wonderful. Praying for this dead church. Praying for the elders. Uh, praying that God's life might come into this thing. When I finish praying, I go into the main auditorium, and all of a sudden, in my imagination, the place is full of people. And I start leading worship. This is 5 o'clock in the morning. And I'm going for it. When all of a sudden, I feel like there are eyes on my back. The superintendent of this particular denomination had come the night before. And that hadn't had a place to put him. So they'd put him in the other room. <laughs> and he'd listen to my prayers all the way through. <laughs> so be careful where you pray. There might be somebody listening. <clears throat> I turned and looked at him. And I said... Sir, I'm sorry. I didn't realize you were here. You know, he never said a word. I, I walked out of the building, and I've never seen him since. <laughs> if you have your Bibles, come with me to the first book of Samuel. And we're going to spend a little bit of time on this portion of Scripture, First Samuel chapter 20. First Samuel chapter 20. <clears throat> Um, because of time, uh, allow me to just give you a, a little bit of background to this, and then I'll zero in on the portion that I'd like us to meditate on tonight. Um, this is a story between David and Jonathan. Uh, in chapter 19, David escapes from uh, Saul who is after him. And Jonathan is not aware of this. And in chapter 20, David comes back to say, Jonathan, your dad wants to kill me. And Jonathan says, no, that cannot be because if dad wanted to do that, he would have told me. And David says, I'm telling you, he wants to kill me. And so a plan is hatched here where Jonathan is going to go before his father and inquire about this matter. And when that has happened, he will then come back and give David a signal concerning what his father's attitude is toward him. So Jonathan is going to go now before his father, and, and, and the portion we're going to read is where David is saying to Jonathan, so how am I going to know what, what the message is? Um, so in verse 18, then Jonathan said to David, Tomorrow is the new moon, and you will be missed. 1 Samuel 20, verse 18. Because your seat will be empty, and when you have stayed three days, go down quickly and come to the place where you hid on the day of the deed, and remain by the stone Ezel. Then I'll shoot three arrows to the side as, as though I shot at a target. And there I will send a lad saying, Go find the arrows. If I expressly say to the Lord, look, the arrows are on this side of you, get them and come, then as the Lord lives, there's safety for you and no harm. But if I say thus to the young man, look, the arrows are beyond you, 
go your way, for the Lord has sent you away. And so Jonathan goes before his father, and uh, we know the story of what happens. Uh, Saul is mad with Jonathan and actually attempts to take his life. He attempts to pin him to the wall with his spear. Uh, the next morning, and so it was, verse 35, in the morning that Jonathan went out into the field at the time appointed with David, and a little lad was with him. Then he said to his lad, now run, find the arrows which I shoot. As the lad ran, he shot an arrow beyond him. When the lad had come to the place where the arrow was, which Jonathan had shot, Jonathan cried out after the lad and said, is not the arrow beyond you is not the arrow beyond you. So Jonathan cries out of the lad, make haste, hurry, do not delay. So Jonathan's lad gathered up the, the, the arrows and came back to his master, but the lad did not know anything. Only Jonathan and David knew of the matter. Then Jonathan gave his weapons to his lad, and say to him, go carry them to the city. As soon as the lad had gone, David arose from the place toward the south, fell on his face to the ground, and bowed three times. And they kissed one another, and they wept together. But David more so. Then Jonathan said to David, go in peace, since we have both sown in the name of the Lord, saying, may the Lord be between you and me, and between your descendants and my descendants forever. So he arose and departed, and Jonathan went into the city. Would you turn to your neighbor and say, the arrows are beyond? No, I, di I didn't hear you, and you didn't turn. Would you say to your neighbor, the arrows are beyond? Something interesting happens uh, in this portion of Scripture. <clears throat> you will recall that David had been anointed king over Israel. Samuel had gone and anointed the young man as the next king over Israel. But this was a private ceremony before his brothers. And you'll recall that when this happened, the Spirit of the Lord came upon David. But at the same time, the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul. And you know the story of how an evil spirit uh, torments uh, Saul, and, and David is brought in as a musician to soothe uh, the spirit of the king. The story of 1 Samuel chapter 17 is very familiar to us, how that somewhere along the line there's a war between the Israelites and the Philistines. And David goes and he slays the giant Goliath. We know the story of how in 1 Samuel 18, the women begin to sing and they say, Saul has slain his thousands and David has slain his ten thousands. And this is where the animosity begins in the heart of Saul because he says, if they have attributed thousands to me and ten thousands to him, what else will they not do? Are they not going to give the kingdom over to him? And from this moment onwards, David is a marked man. The Bible tells us that he behaves very wisely as he goes in and out to accomplish the errands, to carry out the errands that Saul sends him on. Know the story of how David eventually becomes son-in-law to, to Saul as he marries uh, Saul's daughter. And so at this point in time, David is a general in, in Saul's army who's carrying out instructions, you know, given by, by Saul. He goes in and he goes out. 
and his son-in-law to Saul. This, this, is a, this could be a great life where, you know, he probably has um, quarters not too far from the palace, uh, you know, having married uh, the, the king's son, in, uh, the, king's son in, the king's daughter. And um, he is living what could be a comfortable life. But just to remind you that this life is not what God intended for him. God had something beyond the place where David is at this moment in time. And God, as is customary with him, engineers circumstances so that his plan kicks into motion. And so we find Saul really after the life of David. And on this occasion, something dramatic, something drastic happens on this particular day as we focus on this portion of Scripture. David and Jonathan um, meet, and as they meet, um, a, a, an important event occurs. As Jonathan shoots the arrows and declares the arrows are beyond, he's sending a message to David. And he's saying, David, you cannot come back to the palace. It's time for you to leave. And from this moment onwards, there is a shift in David's life. For the next few years, he's going to be a fugitive. He's going to be running for his life because Saul is after him. It's a, it's a tiny moment. He's going to leave the comfort of the palace. He's going to leave the comfort of his, his, his life with his wife. He's going to leave his position as a general in Saul's army. He's going to leave all that behind. And he's going to live in caves and dens for a number of years as Saul pursues him. There's a tectonic shift in the life of David. There's something that I'm, I'm carrying tonight. Um, okay, so, so David's life cannot be the same. He cannot go back to his life as before because something has shifted on this particular day and, and remember that he is the anointed one of Israel, and, and before him is the throne that he must get to. But before he gets to the throne, there are years that he's going to have to spend in the wilderness as God prepares him as the next king of Israel. Saul is going to be the king, but his reign has been cut short by the Lord. Although he's going to reign for a number of years still, God has appointed the next leader. I feel like tonight God is speaking to us as a family and he's saying the arrows are beyond. I feel like this weekend, whether we understand it or not, there's a shift that's taking place in the spirit realm. Where God somehow is bringing in the next generation. I feel like God is speaking to the fathers. I feel like many of us here have slain our Goliaths. As a movement, we have slain our Goliaths. There are things that we are known for. There are things that are admired about this family. We could settle down to the glory of, you know, having slain Goliath. But that's not what God has destined us for. The arrows are beyond. I believe that God is speaking to us as a family and saying, I want to shift something. 
I want to move something. And folks, having come here, you cannot go back to your life as normal. Because God is putting the nations in our hearts. He's putting things in our hearts as we declare, like we were singing, and, and we speak about the nations. We need to realize that there's a throne before us. David is marching to Hebron. If he sits in the palace with Saul, Hebron is going to be a distance away. It's going to be far from him. And I believe that as a family, God has something for us tonight. And he said this weekend, he's saying, the arrows are beyond. And so I believe God is speaking to us about this shift where, where he wants us not to go back and settle down to the comforts of our old life, the, the, the feeling of, yes, we slew the giant Goliath, but to understand that the arrows are beyond. There's a kingdom that God wants to manifest, and we are being called as his sons to move toward that kingdom. And so he, is, he goes from here, and uh, he has to run for his life. For the next few years, he's going to be a fugitive. And he's going to have to live by his wits. His life is in danger. He's hunted like a, a partridge on the mountains. He, he, he's going to be betrayed by those that are seeking favors from Saul. And he can't trust anybody. Uh, let's go on this journey uh, with him and see what happens. The first stop uh, is in the tabernacle where David is, is hungry and he, has, he, he goes to the priests and he asks for bread. And while there, he also asks for a sword. And the priest, you know, gives him the sword of Goliath, the sword that he'd, he'd used to, to slay the giant Goliath. David says, there's none like this one, so give that to me. And uh, you will remember that while he was there, there was a servant of uh, Saul called Doak, who was detained there before the Lord, and he witnesses all this. And eventually, he goes and he tells Saul of this whole encounter between David and the priests. And you know the story of what happened. The entire family of 80 people was wiped out. I, I don't know how all this fits in, but we heard this morning about how dangerous this walk is. We heard about the different ones that have been killed as they've come to the faith in the Lord. I want to say to you that as we respond to the call of God and go on this journey, there's going to be dangers. And some might not make it in terms of this life. I believe God is calling us as a family to prepare for this. Because as we take the word of the Lord to the nations, there will be danger. And some in the household of the Lord, of this family, may pay with their lives. And so I challenge you tonight to make that first stop and to pick up the word, the sword, Some of you carry prophetic words that have been spoken over your lives. God is taking us back to those prophetic words and He's saying, as you journey, as you start on this journey, remember what I say to you. Remember the nations that I called you to. It may seem distant to you. You may feel, well, we killed Goliath 
many years ago, but God is bringing that back to you. And it's the sword that you're going to use as you go to the nations. And so David moves from there. And very quickly we find 400 men with him. In all this story, you know, about those men, uh, uh, the Bible says that they were distressed, they were in debt, they were discontented. Again, tonight is almost like a, a reminder of some of the things that were spoken to us this morning. Where David takes this bunch of no gooders and for a number of years he's going, to be a one, he's going to be wandering around the desert with them and God tends these men into mighty men of valor. Sometimes when you look around and you say, well, we're talking about the nations and we're talking about you know, a force that's going to guard there. You're talking about the next generation. Where is this next generation? Because I don't see mighty men like David who are giant killers. Uh, let me tell you that God is looking for the not gooders like you and I. And uh, he wants to turn us into mighty men of faith and valor, mighty women of faith. And so God is challenging us to look around and sometimes when we pray for laborers, we are expecting God to do a miracle, produce, you know, mature men who are going to, and women who are going to do great things. But God is saying, look at your company. And God is challenging each one of us to look at those that are around us because it's those that are despised. It's those that are weak, as Paul speaks in 1 Corinthians, uh, in, in, in 1 Corinthians. It's, 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 he says, look at you, brothers. Not many are wise. Not many are, 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 are rich in any way. But God has taken the foolish things and turn them around in order to confound the wisdom of this age. And so if you feel that you're surrounded by, by weak men and, and your team is weak, you're actually in good company. Because as we heard this morning, it has to be Jesus. It cannot be our human strength. It has to be of God. If we're going to take, take the nations, if we're going to go into this new phase that God is speaking to us about, if we're going to go beyond. It's going to have to be God. And so for some of you, you're going to live in caves and dens. For some of you, your caves are going to be those cabins that fly in the skies. For some of you, your caves are going to be those strange beds that you lie on, you know, different bed every night. For some of you, your, 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 your caves are going to be like what Nikki was speaking to us about last night. Strange places where you don't understand the word of what they're saying. We're going to be ar wandering around in caves and dens. And for some of us, we've been places where there will be those who want to betray us. Some of us here will be betrayed. Not everybody will succeed in evading soul. For some, soul is going to catch up with you as we go into this battle. And so I just want to warn you of two dangers here that, that I see. One is... A danger from within where those of your own company, those within the body of Christ may actually betray you. Some of what has happened in places like Rwanda or some of what happened in places like Rwanda and Burundi did not really happen because of outsiders. It, it happened because of people within the church. And so there's the danger that comes from within. 
But there's also the danger that comes from without. David gets to a point, I, I haven't got time to, to really dig into this in full, but David gets to a point where he's tired of running away from Saul. And so he decides, uh uh, I'm going to get out of here. And uh, he goes to the Philistines. Some of us may get so tired and so weary that we are in danger of compromising with the system of the world. Where if we are not careful, we are going to enter into a pact with the world around us so that there is no war between us and, and them. So David, for a while, lives amongst the Philistines. They give him a city, the city of Ziklag. And you know how at this time he is living a compromised life where he's living double, where he is a double standard. He goes on raids and he comes and he lies to, to, to King Akish about where, he, where he's been. And, and he's living this, this, this double you know, life. And at some point he nearly, go, he actually goes to war against his own people with the Philistines. And God has to step in and rescue him from that compromise. But you know, of course, in the rescue that he's left his family exposed. And you know the story of the Amalekites. And now David gets to a point where the men want to stone him because of the anguish of their souls. Coming back, finding their camp raised to the ground, their children gone, their wives gone, everything gone. When we compromise and uh, walk hand in hand with the enemy, we are putting at risk, we are putting our families to risk and putting the house of the Lord to risk. And so God somehow steps in and, and of course we know how God in his mercy comes to David at that moment and encourages him as he, as he comes back and and he calls for the priest and, and he asks for direction from the Lord. The Lord speaks to him and says, you pursue, you will overtake, and you will recover all. And so he does that. And of course, you know how that story ends, where he gets everything back. He comes back to Ziklag and... Uh, News comes to him that the man that he had so jealously, whose life he had so jealously protected over the years, and on, on, on two occasions, they had occasion where he could have taken Saul's life, he is told that Saul has died in battle. Hebron then occurs, and David is anointed king over a portion of the nations of Israel. There's a battle that I believe that we are facing. And there are challenges that are ahead of us. Just like David spent that time in the wilderness, it wasn't just about running away from Saul. There were things that God was shaping in the heart of this man as he was preparing him for the, for, for the throne. You'll remember things like just the way that he handled Abigail and how God saved him from, you know, avenging himself and, and, and taught him that he wasn't to avenge himself. You'll recall how um, the, the 200 uh, are left, you know, by the river. They're so tired, they cannot pursue the Amalekites. And when they get back, the 400 say, take your stuff and get away from here. And David formulates a policy there and says, guys, we're going to stick together. We are family. And so during that time, God is doing some things in the heart of David as he prepares him for, for the throne. I want to mention a few things that this generation is going to face as we go for the arrows that are ahead. I see several challenges. I've mentioned before the challenge of the different generations that we are ministering to. How many of you know that there's no one size fits all in this battle that we are faced with? 
Many of us came into this movement or at a time when we were much younger than we are. And at the time, there probably was just maybe one generation or two generations in the church. But right now, we have five generations. The veterans, the, the boomers, Generation X, Generation Y, Generation Z, the millennials are here. They're all in the house. And God wants to train us so that we are able to talk to all of them and bring the gospel to all of them. We're going to have to learn the language of this generation so that we can be relevant in speaking to them. What about the issue of technology? The way that we process education, the way that we process communication, and all of that has changed as a result of technology. And so as we wander in this wilderness... These are some of the challenges that we're going to have to face and we're going to have to come to terms with in, 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 in order to understand them and be able to utilize them for, for the kingdom of God. What about the issue of resource mobilization? We have a global financial meltdown and unless we get to a place where we trust God to, to, to provide for all that we're going to need, this is going to be a hindrance that is going to stop us from running the race like we're supposed to run. I, I talk about the Jacob generation. Some of us, the older ones, come from the Isaac generation where everything was predictable. Isaac inherited from his father uh, uh, um, uh, everything that Abraham had. In fact, before he dies, Abraham makes sure that there's no one around to compete with Isaac. And so Isaac inherits everything. And Isaac lives in a very predictable world. He sows in the land, he reaps, he becomes very prosperous, digs up his father's wells and all of that. He lives in a world that is very, very predictable. But the next generation is the Jacob generation. Jacob lives home with nothing. When he crosses the river on his way back in Gen 32, he says, Lord, I crossed this place with just my stuff. But now I'm two companies. And, and, and the Lord has been speaking to me about this generation and how, we are gonna, how this generation is going to create resources. And, and I have three words that I'm still trying to figure out. And those words are spotted, speckled, and what's the other S? A striped. Okay. This generation is going to have to figure out what God is saying in terms of those three words. Spotted, speckled, and striped. Because God wants to give you a technology in terms of resource mobilization where you are smart. Your wages are going to be changed ten times. You live in a cutthroat world where you cannot trust anyone around you concerning finances. And things are going to shift. You... you the game is changing all the time. But I sense like in terms of resource mobilization, God is saying he's going to give you wisdom. And you just have to look out for those three things. The theological platform has shifted. Postmodernity. This is where we are now. Things have changed completely because God's word and God is no longer the center of man's thinking. We are in a, in a theological wilderness where all kinds of things are happening as we run around this desert and as we live in dens and so on. The leadership challenge, who wants to be a leader today? And that's the world that God is calling you to. That's the world that God is calling this next generation to. But in the midst of it all, people are looking for leaders who are credible. People are looking for leaders who are authentic. And that's part of the challenge that you're going to face as you run for your lives. It's this kind of leadership that, you know, the world is looking for from you. What about the shift in the geopolitical map of the world? What are you going to do with the Arab Spring? What are you going to do with Egypt the way it is? What are you going to do with uh, Syria? What are you going to do with uh, Libya? 
What are you going to do with uh, Southern Sudan? What are you going to do with CAR, Central African Republic? What are you going to do with uh, Ukraine? Italy and Greece. What are you going to do with these this hot spots where all this is happening and God is calling us to minister to these nations? The geopolitical map has shifted. And it continues to shift. There is no, no certainty anymore. We, we don't know what's going to happen. And this is the wilderness that God is calling this next generation to. There's a host of other issues like green issues, human trafficking, science, and where it's, it's going to. It's a wilderness. And there are no clear answers. All I can say to you tonight is that the arrows are beyond. There's a kingdom that's ahead. Its rule must break into the present. And I feel that God is shifting something. The baton is being handed over. And God is saying that the arrows are beyond. He's challenging us to think beyond where we've been. We cannot go back to the comfort of yesterday. The nations are beckoning us. And I believe that the fathers of this movement have been asking God and saying, God, what's next? And part of the answer to that is that God is saying the next generation needs to be commissioned. It needs to be released. We've prayed these prayers before where we've laid hands on, on, on uh, the next generation. I, I know we've done that. But I sense in the Spirit, if, if, I'm picking up what, if I'm picking up what the Spirit of God is saying in, in the right way, if I'm, if I'm hearing right, I sense that there's something in the Spirit where God is saying the arrows are beyond. And this call has to be heard by that Davidic you know, generation to understand that from here on, you're going to have to seek those arrows. They are not this side, they are the other side. They are beyond. May God give us the grace to pursue those arrows in whatever way this means and whatever this means for us. May God give the fathers the grace to help guide the search for those arrows. I see Jonathan as the one handing over the dynasty to David. I see Jonathan on this occasion saying, David, I, I know that God has anointed you to be king over Israel. And this is going to be the last but one moment when these two meet. Is it possible that there are some fathers who we are going to see for the last time? Or maybe we're getting ready to be at that point where Jonathan is going to see David one more time as he encourages him and, you know, strengthens him in the, in the, in the, in the fight, in the you know, in his, in his fight against his father, where he says, my father is not going to touch you because God's hand is upon you. I believe God is speaking to some of the fathers and saying, we need to encourage the younger ones and just keep encouraging them to say to them that the kingdom is in their hands. God is going to bless them. God is going to use them mightily when they feel discouraged. God is speaking to some of the fathers and saying, you're going to have to go to the wilderness sometimes, and look for David and tell him that it's okay. God is on his side. And so there's need to encourage this generation to say, keep running. Keep running. The time is coming, and you will be okay. 
David has to be very wise, like, like we said, and, and one of the things is that he really doesn't want to touch a soul. We have an enemy here, and when I go to Africa, uh, in Africa we, we know how to deal with the devil. Uh, we bind him, we tear him apart. Uh, it's like, it's like uh, this brother who says, you know, when I get angry, um, I want to shoot you. I want to hang you. I want to drown you. I want to burn you. When I've done all of that, I'll kill you. <laughs> so we know what to do with the enemy. We bind him. We, we, we do all sorts of things to him, and, and, and we, we cast him in hell, and we lock hell. <laughs> but the trouble is he keeps coming back. <laughs> There's a sense in which we need to understand that the battle is not our battle. The Lord is going to deal with the enemy. And he will give us the victories. He will give the, 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 this uh, generation the victories that you need. And the fathers just need to keep encouraging you to let you know that, yeah, he may still be around, but the kingdom is yours and you've been anointed. So... The, to the young generation, I want to say this to you. You need to go for the arrows. The arrows are beyond. The Spirit of the Lord is saying the arrows are beyond. Whatever you are doing, wherever you are, look for the arrows ahead. Don't look for the arrows behind. Don't look to where you are now for the arrows because the arrows of the Lord's anointing are ahead. You need to press in. You need to look ahead. You need to run. You need to keep running. There's there's a kingdom that we must win. There's, there's places that we must go, you know, to for the Lord. There, there's a Hebron that is ahead of you. There's a kingdom that God wants to manifest in the earth through you. Look for the arrows ahead. 